Awesome. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the final session of the SQLIST Science Symposium. I'm very excited to be here today with our judges, our speaker, and of course, Noeet in the background. So we have um, Clarice coming in, and we have Cecilia, and excuse me if I pronounce this incorrectly, we have Dil Rakshi, is that how I say it? Yes, yes, yeah, good. Awesome. And we have, of course, also Noeen in the background, who is the chair and brainchild of the symposium, and of course myself, my name is Ashley, and I'm happy to be the vice chair of the symposium and your moderator today. So before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we, at least here in Vancouver, we are um, living on the traditional land of the, the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Seashelt, the Squamish, the Stolo, uh, of the Stolo people, and that just to, just take a moment to respect and um, consider all those who have come here before that us and everything that we've gained from being in this area here today. Now we are in our final category of the science symposium, which is global warming, earth and environmental sciences. And we have our final presentation that we're very excited to see. Now, before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping rules. As you may have noticed, uh, today's event is being video recorded and it will go up on YouTube uh, within 24 to 48 hours. So you'll be able to view it again there. We do ask that everyone stay muted during the presentation. And that if anyone in our audience has any questions during the presentation, please drop those into the chat box uh, during the presentation and we will be able to go over that in the Q&A from the audience section. So anytime you have those questions, just drop them in the chat. Now, um, I would like to just take a moment to thank our sponsors. Uh, they've also helped make the Science Symposium possible. We have Northeastern University Vancouver. They have a 95 employment rate for biotechnology. So if you're interested in that, please check them out. We have Admir Bioinnovations. So if you want to polish your skills in business or science, check out their programs. We have Abcelera, who discovered the antibody that neutralizes viral variants in COVID-19. So very excited to have them on board. As well as Microsoft. So if you're interested in an internship in IT, check out their website. We have Acutus Therapeutics. Uh, they provided the lipid nanoparticle delivery system, a key element of the development of the Pfizer vaccine. So very happy to have them here with us as well as Kruger, who developed a revolutionary bio-based material with unique properties called BioCell. And this new additive will enhance the performance of your products unlike any other and can be leveraged in numerous applications, including automated construction and aerospace to name a few. So very cool product there. Now I will take this moment to give our judges a second to a moment to introduce themselves. And then I'll move on to our speaker. I give you a moment to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you, and then launch into your presentation. So that being said, um, Cecilia, I will start with you today. Hello, thank you, Ashley. I'm elated to be here in this third uh, presentation of the climate change uh, cycle. I'm a lecturer at the Faculty of Health Sciences in Simon Fraser University. And I work in environmental health, so how everything around us impacts human health specifically, although it's all interconnected. So, of course, climate change has to do a lot with what I research. And I'm thrilled to learn about the Rooks' research today. Thank you. Thank you. And Clarice, I'll move over to you. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. So um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Clarice Kenta. I'm currently affiliated with Student Energy. It's a global youth-led nonprofit empowering the next generation of leaders who are accelerating our transition to just and sustainable energy future. Before moving to Canada, I was doing project development of renewable energy projects, specifically solar, wind, and um, geothermal. I started my career actually as a geoscience and was exposed to also to geothermal power project before I pursue my master's in energy systems in Australia um, so that I can expand my knowledge in technical business and social aspect of energy and climate change. My interest is definitely in um, clean energy transition as well as the climate energy nexus. So very excited to hear your presentation, Floriski. So um, pass it over back to Ashley. Thank you so much. And yeah, with that being said, Dilrashi, we will pass it over to you. We'd love to hear a little bit about your background and then feel free to share your slides and move into your presentation. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Ashley. 
and I'm Dilrukshi Kumbhale Lenege, and I'm a second year Master of Science graduate student at the University of Alberta in the Department of Agriculture, Food and Nutritional Science. And I'm currently working on my Master of Science research under the supervision of Dr. Malinda Tilagaratna in the Plant Microbe Lab. Can I move on to my presentation, Ashley? Or... Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Sure, I'll share my screen. Perfect. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, is it all good? Yeah, it looks perfect. Okay. Thank you very much for being here today for my press research presentation. And today I'm going to present my Master of Science research on investigating drought resistance soybean cultivars to maintain symbiotic nitrogen fixation and meal production. Here is my overview. First, I will give you a brief introduction on what is soybean, what is symbiotic nitrogen fixation, and what is drought stress. Next, my research hypothesis, methods, results, conclusions, and finally, I'll wrap up my presentation with my future experiments. Soybean. Soybean was originated and domesticated in East Asia, basically in China, 6,000 to 9,000 years ago. Later on, it was introduced to North America in 1765. The main use of soybean is as an animal protein feed and vegetable oil. In addition to that, it plays a major role in human diet, especially in developing countries as a rich source of plant-based protein. In terms of Canada, plant-based protein industry is booming nowadays. The top seven soybean producing countries are Brazil, USA, Argentina, China, Paraguay, India, and Canada. What is symbiotic nitrogen fixation? Most of the plants cannot use atmospheric nitrogen, but legumes such as soybean has the access to use atmospheric nitrogen with the symbiosis of rhizobia, which reside in root nodules. Rhizobia acquire nitrogen from the air and then convert into ammonium compounds and provide it to the host plant. In return, host plant provides photosynthesis products for the rhizobia metabolism. This is the simple illustration of rhizobia symbiotic nitrogen fixation. The annual nitrogen fixation input of top three soybean producing countries in 2019 are Brazil 11.08 teragrams, USA 6.51 teragrams and Argentina 4.78 teragrams. Let's move on to symbiotic nitrogen fixation in a little bit detail. Legumes release chemical signals components called flavonoids and it binds with not D protein in rhizobium and it activates rhizobium not genes or we call it nodulation genes. Then this bacteria produce not factors which we called a complex chemical components which induce or uh, induce the root deformation in soybean. This root deformation will attract towards the rhizobia and then gradually it enclosed by the root hairs and then penetrate, penetrate into the root hairs and then form the nodule. Inside the nodule, nitrogen will be reduced into ammonium compounds by nitrogenase enzyme and these ammonium compounds will eventually form into amino acid and then converted into protein and then provide into the plant parts. What is drought stress? This is actually one of the trending topics in Canada nowadays with the recently experienced heat waves. It is predicted that drought stress will be a huge climatic problem in the near future. In terms of Canada, when you look at these three maps, you can clearly see that dark brown area or very dry soil area is increasing over the time. According to the latest studies, this will be a critical issue in Canadian prairies or Western Canada, which we call the hub of legumes or the protein basket of Canada. Drought stress results, poor plant establishment, growth and yield reduction, poor grain quality, and low nitrogen fixation due to low nodulation and low nitrogen insectivity. In one of my previous slides, I explained you the symbiotic nitrogen fixation process. 
This whole process get disrupted during the drought stress first instant the rise of your pot population, chemical signaling process, production of NOD factors, and binding with NOD D protein. This whole process will be disrupted during drought stress and as a result, low nitrogen fixation occurred. Drought induced low symbiotic nitrogen fixation in nodules by three mechanisms, oxygen limitation in nodules, carbon shortage, and feedback inhibition of nitrogen fixation. With this research background, I developed my research hypothesis. There is an allelic variation associated with drought tolerance in short season Canadian soybean varieties. My research comprised two components, genotyping and phenotyping. For the phenotypic analysis, I conducted a greenhouse experiment. First seeds were surface sterilized and then transferred into pots. Initially three seeds per pot and at the initial stage supplied enough water and added nitrogen free hoglands nutrient solution. And after one week, extra plants were removed, leaving one plant per pot. And after one week, plants were inoculated with bradyrhizomium japonicum. And after two weeks, plants were labeled with 15N in order to measure symbiotic nitrogen fixation in the future. And after three weeks, trout was induced and there were two treatments. 80% fuel capacity well water treatment and 30% fuel capacity drought induced treatment. Here you can see a video of my large greenhouse trial. We arranged the plants into according to a two-factor factorial design to investigate the effects of irrigation on different soybean cultivars. And the main factor was irrigation, and it had two treatments: 80% fuel capacity well water treatment and 30% fuel capacity drought induced treatment. And also the sub-factor was cultivars. And here I have used 106 different short season soybean cultivars with four replicates for each, each irrigation treatment level. So I have already worked with nearly 1,000 plants in my greenhouse. And after about seven weeks, leaf chlorophyll content was measured using SPAD meter and photosynthesis, tomato conductance, and transpiration data were collected using LECO 6400 photosynthesis system. And during the harvesting stage, yield parameters such as number of pots per plant, number of pots per pot, colored seed weight, and grain yield was measured. In order to measure percentage of nitrogen derived from atmosphere, seed drying will be performed at 60 Celsius for three days, and then grinding using wily mill grinder and a home genizer, and then isotope dilution technique will be performed. What is this isotope dilution technique? The theory behind this technique is both the fixing plant and non-fixing plant have the access to 15N in the soil. But since the fixing plant has the access to atmospheric nitrogen, this 15N gets diluted. How it gets diluted? Because the more than 99% of atmospheric nitrogen are 14N. By use, using this technique, I will analyze for nitrogen concentration and 15N concentration using this formula. And here I'll be using non-nodulating maple presto as my reference. One of the most interesting component of my research is I developed a semi-automated irrigation system, which is an Arduino base to facilitate my moisture adjustment procedure inside the greenhouse. In this system, you simply have to keep your pot on this blue basket and enter your pot cord onto the screen, and then it will automatically add water up to our required level while saving the data into the university cloud. This is actually very portable and easy to handle throughout my greenhouse, throughout my greenhouse experience because I had like almost nearly 1,000 plants to just water every other day. As the final step of my research, I will have to perform a genome-wide association study using mixed linear model, general linear model, and here fixed and random model circulating probability unification implemented in Microsoft Open R. And here population metrics and kinship metrics will be used and you as covariates. Let's move on to my results. First, first uh, leaf chlorophyll content. Here we observed a significant soil moisture effect on leaf chlorophyll content. 
The leaf chlorophyll content was higher in 30% fuel capacity drought induced treatment with compared to the 80% fuel capacity well water treatment. Interestingly, that means nitrogen accumulated in leaves under drought compared to the well water treatment. According to the PUS literature, uh, this is one of the feedback mechanisms that inhibit nitrogen fixation during drought stress, and we observe the same trend in here as well. In this figure, x-axis represents my soybean varieties, where y-axis represents pad meter reading or the leaf flower fill content. And this figure clearly represents a significant genotypic variability among soybean varieties for leaf flower fill content. If I explain you the relationship between spad weed meter reading, flower fill content, and nitrogen accumulation, nitrogen is the basic component of chlorophyll and by using SPAD meter, we are measuring the leaf chlorophyll content where it gives a clear idea about the nitrogen accumulation in the leaf. Let's move on to stomatal conductance data. What is stomatal conductance? It is the rate of passage of CO2 entering or water wave exiting through the stomata of a leaf. In terms of stomatal conductance, here we observed a significant soil moisture effect. And here, the 30% fill capacity was significantly low under drought compared to the well water treatment. In this figure, again, x-axis represents my soybean varieties and y-axis represents the stomatal conductance. And here you can clearly see a significant genotypic variability among soybean varieties for leaf stomatal conductance as well. Let's move on to my photosynthesis data. Here we observed that the level of soil moisture had no significant effect on leaf photosynthesis. And the leaf photosynthesis was similar between well water treatment and drought treatment. And in this figure, again, it is significant that there is a significant genotypic variability among soybean varieties for leaf photosynthesis as well. Let's move on to water use efficiency data. Here, the level of soil moisture had no significant effect on water use efficiency, and the water use efficiency was similar between the well water treatment and drought treatment. Again, in this figure, x-axis represents soybean varieties, where y-axis represents the water use efficiency, which is the photosynthesis divided by transpiration rate. And here you can clearly see a significant genotypic variability among serving varieties for water use efficiency as well. Let's move on to my yield parameters. First, number of pods data. And here we observed a significant soil moisture effect on number of pods per plant and drought significantly reduced the number of pods per plant in 30% fuel capacity treatment with compared to the 80% fuel capacity treatment. And again, in this figure, you can clearly see that there is a significant genotypic variability among soybean varieties for number of pots per plant as well. Let's move on to number of seeds and data. And here we observed a significant soil moisture effect on number of seeds per plant and drought significantly reduced the number of seeds per plant compared to the well water treatment. And in this figure, again, you can see a significant genotypic variability among soybean varieties for number of seeds per plant as well. At last, we will move on to my seed weight data. And here we observed a significant soil moisture effect on seed weight per plant. Drought has significantly reduced the seed weight per plant compared to the 80% bulk water treatment. And in essence, we can say that the percentage yield reduction is about 30%. And again, in this figure, it is obvious that there is a significant genotypic variability among soybean varieties for seed weight per plant. And with that, I can conclude there was a significant genotypic variability among soybean cultivars for leaf chlorophyll content, stomatal conductance, and leaf water synthesis at flowering stage, and number of pots per plant, number of seeds per plant, seed weight per plant at harvesting stage, and nitrogen accumulated in soybean leaves under drought stress and drought reduced the stomatal conductance at flowering stage, and drought reduced the number of pods per plant, number of seeds per plant, and seed weight per plant at harvesting stage. 
As my future experiments, I'll have to prepare samples for nitrogen fixation analysis. This is one of the most important aspects in my research because I'm not aware that anyone is doing research on symbiotic nitrogen fixation under drought stress in legume. So this is really, really important aspect in my research. So I'll, I have to measure nitrogen fixation in each and empty cultivar using elemental analyzer coupled to a Delta V mass spectrometer and perform a genome-wide association study in the future. With that, I would like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Maninda Tilakratna, and Dr. Dev Torkumani, Dr. Franzua Belsai, Dr. Linda Gorim, and Dr. Gavin Chen for their kind guidance to, throughout my research, and Kelly Dunford, Shami Zain, and Ishan Chaturanga, and Daniel Jodaliti for their kind support throughout my greenhouse experiment. And this, this research project is funded by NSERP and University of Alberta. So I would like to thank all our funding, funding, funding agencies for their financial support throughout my research. And thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was a really fascinating presentation. Um, I just, I wanna, I would love like a greenhouse and your greenhouse looks beautiful by the way. It's like very yeah. <laughs> Thanks Ashley. <laughs> Uh, I will pass it over to our judges for our Q&A session. And I'm not sure if anyone wants to start. I'll leave it in your capable hands. Um, I can start. Okay, and then we can take turns as we yeah. have done in the past. That's good. So my first question, uh, the Rukshi is, you mentioned there was a reduced number of pots and a reduced number of seeds. And specifically, with these two events, with these two measures that you you found, what are going? What are the impacts in the in the cost benefit analysis of soybean cultivation? Uh, can you please mention which parameters again? Number and of pots. The reduced number of pots and reduced number and weight of seeds. Yes, during drought stress, during during the drought stress. The yield parameters such as uh, number of pods, uh, number of weight of the seeds can be reduced in some varieties. Mm -hmm. This is actually based on number of cultivars, like 106 soybean varieties. So our major goal is to find out which uh, variety actually gives a higher symbiotic nitrogen fixation and higher yield during drought stress. That's the main goal uh, to identify which variety and even which trait, which genomic region in that variety gives that, that kind of a higher yield and symbiotic nitrogen fixation during drought stress. Okay. That was actually the main goal. So during drought stress, I observed that there's a, a significant genotypic variability among all the varieties. And here I have to find out which variety has perform behave very well and which variety perform worse. So based on that, I can do a cost benefit analysis actually. Oh, okay, excellent, thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, hi Del Rushki. I think, yeah, that was your answer is basically the first question I was gonna ask sort of like the big picture, or like the objective vision of your study, but I think you mentioned that it's more of like understanding which variety works better with increasing drought that we're, that's happening. So I think that's good. I think one of my question would be with regards to the methodology, how long did you do the experiment? I think that yeah. was- yeah. yeah, actually uh, I did my experiment for like seven months because mm -hmm. it says, uh, it, because I have to wait till they mature, they mature and they are shedding leaves and they, that's the correct uh, ideal stage to collect the pods. So I have to wait for their entire life cycle. So it's like more than like uh, nearly seven months. Yeah, so with regards, just a follow up with that. So after seven months, that's when you started inducing this different irrigation um, level. Um, are there other sort of, I know you're in a greenhouse, sort of like a controlled setting, but any, you know, external factors that could have affected um, seasonal variation or sort of that or anything that you think might have um, or you're good with like having the control set up? Yes, uh, so far I'm uh, good with having the control set up, but uh, for instance, there can be, I, I didn't experience that, but there can be instances like pest and disease attacks. 
since mm -hmm. I am growing large number of plants, uh, if any disease uh, introduced into the greenhouse, it will be a huge loss. But so far, I'm controlling like temperature, humidity, and the light level uh, at the optimum level. So I didn't experience any kind of external factor affecting my research so far, but I have to be on alert regarding any pest and disease attacks. And because so, soybean is actually prone, very prone for mm -hmm. pest and disease attacks. And also when the, all the other greenhouses and both all the other greenhouses also located on the same flow. So they're connecting with some different like pathogen related research. So I have to be on alert okay. regarding yeah. that. Awesome, thanks so much. No, knock on wood with those pathogens. <laughs> <laughs> My question is also about the, the methodology. How did you choose the parameters that you were comparing? All those excellent graphs that you showed us. How did you choose all of these points to measure and graph? Yes, you mean the how I selected the parameters, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, actually at the very beginning, my research plan was to measure the above ground parameters and both the below ground parameters. Above ground parameters like uh, shoot, uh, like shoot photosynthesis, stromatal conductors, and likewise. And the below ground parameters like root parameters, fines, and uh, nodule parameters, nodulation parameters, likewise. But for this time limitation, as I'm conducting a master of science research, I decided to go with the uh, above ground parameters. And for that, from them, I decided to. Uh, evaluate first physiological parameters and then the yield parameters. That's how I decide, decided uh, what parameters should I collect. Oh, excellent, thank you. Yeah, my next question is it's more of, so yeah, the, the way I see it, the study is more so like focus on sort of climate mitigation, sorry, climate change adaptation strategy specific for um, soybean. Um, I'm just wondering, um, so in the context of say climate change, the mitigation aspect, can you tell us about, you know, how nitrogen management for instance can help us sort of like, yeah. yeah. Just here, uh, soybean, uh, not only soybean, but uh, almost all the legumes fixed nitrogen have the ability to uh, fix atmospheric nitrogen. And based on that, soybean fixed like 77% of uh, nitrogen in the atmosphere, according to statistics. So uh, if a farmer grinds soybean in his, uh, in his field, he, there is no need of applying nitrogen fertilizer. I mean synthetic nitrogen fertilizer because it it has the ability to atmos uh, fix atmospheric nitrogen. If we apply nitrogen fertilizer, it it is more nitrogen fertilizer is the most widely used synthetic fertilizer nowadays, and it has chemical cousins like ammonium sulfate, sodium nitrate, and potassium nitrate, which are the significant contributors to climate change. After farmers apply these kind of uh, synthetic fertilizers to crop chain, uh, there can be the, uh, a chemical reaction chain that generate nitrous oxide, which is we call a greenhouse gas, which affect for the uh, climate change. So uh, climate change are in global warming. So that if a farmer is using uh, any crop like soybean, any legume, so he, uh, he's actually doing kind of a favorable impact for the environment and contributing to avoid the global warming. And uh, by and under and one of the other impact is it, ha it has some residual nitrogen left in the soil after we harvest the soybean. So that is another important aspect that we should consider in growing soybean. So I believe that growing soybean is really, really environmentally friendly uh, while it came satisfying our protein needs. Because on the other, on the other hand, like uh, nowadays, uh, the vegan population is rapidly increasing so that soybean is actually kind of a good solution environmentally and nutritionally, both the aspects, I believe.
Yeah, thank you so much for your explanation. That's great. Thank you. So um, my next question is related with the agricultural communities that are growing soybean, for example. I, I uh, think they're located in Alberta, right? Um, are you, is your research linked somehow with the agricultural communities in this province in Alberta? Yes, yes. Actually, nowadays, uh, New early maturity have expanded uh, the traditional growing areas like southern Ontario. The soybean is basically grown in southern Ontario because of the longer crop duration. But uh, now it has uh, moved into parts like uh, Saskatchewan, Quebec, Manitoba, and Maritimes. And in terms of Alberta, this is actually grown in southern Alberta. Already they have started growing in southern Alberta using irrigation systems. And that's why actually researchers want to uh, find more short season soybean varieties to grow in areas like Alberta. And so with this climate change, actually, with the longer crop duration, it is there's a good potential to expand soybean, culti soybean cultivation in northern regions of Alberta too. It has already started in southern Alberta. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent, thanks. Yeah, I think a while ago you mentioned good thing. There's no pestilence or pathogens or anything that 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 you encountered during your study. But I'm just wondering if you can share with us any like sort of challenge you faced during your study and how you sort of like pivot your experiment. Yes, uh, the main uh, the main uh, challenge I uh, faced during my research is it's kind of a large greenhouse trial because I have already grown like thousand plants and uh, for instance, if we consider eighty percent field capacity plant pot, it weighs like five thousand three three hundred and sixty three grams, and in terms of thirty percent field capacity pot, it weighs like four thousand twenty five grams. And I'm adjusting moisture in each and every pot every other day. So it's kind of a lay, very labor intensive uh, research. So I have to lift that pot every other day and keep it on the balance and apply water up to its 80% fuel capacity weight level. So it, it's kind of actually very hard during with my coursework. And so that, that's the reason actually I developed a semi-automated irrigation system to facilitate my moisture ad adjustment procedure. And this is this method is quite e really easy. So I just have to simply keep the pot on the machine itself and then it automatically adds water. And then it's just a matter of lifting it and keep it on the bench. That's how I overcome that uh, situation. And I have already, uh, wrote a paper on that my irrigation system. It's kind of really interesting and it's very cheap. I developed it for around two hundred dollars, so it's uh, it's really helpful for other researchers as well because most people ask from me about the uh, how you develop that equipment. So I have already wrote that paper and it will be published uh, within two three months for sure. And that was the major challenge. I and also uh, take caring of the plants without any disease. So I had I had access. I um, I allowed the access only for few people to my greenhouse. Even I didn't uh, allow to access all the greenhouse staff even for my greenhouse. That's why that's how I maintained these plants up to this date. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. I can totally agree. I can't, I'm not a green thumb person. So I'm like, I can't imagine you handling a thousand all at the same time, have to keep them healthy. It's a big like task. And um, yeah, good job on that. Yeah, even during the past uh, heat waves, during the heat waves, yeah. that period, the greenhouse temperature was very high, like closer to 40. So I had to take care of them every, every day. So I went very early morning and took care of the, my plants. So working with plants is like working with babies. They have yeah. to be <laughs> babysitting. Yeah, plants. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dilruski. Yeah. Yes. Do I have time for one last question, Ashley? Okay. Uh, my question, Dilruski, is: What would you like to see in this field in the long term? 
you mean my research, right? Yeah, we yes. can narrow it down to your research. What would you like to carry on with, with this project? Yes, uh, I, I actually would like to um, uh, develop my research. Here I am only using uh, trout strays, but in the future there is a potential to expand my research into uh, into examine both drought rates and heat. I think that will be, that will give a more broad picture for the uh, drought stress analysis. Uh, so that, uh, and on the other hand, uh, this research actually provides uh, a, good, a good idea for the plant breeders. Because here the main goal is to identify the varieties which have higher drought resistant for in terms of giving a higher symbiotic nitrogen fixation and higher yield and by that we can have we can provide different molecular markers and that will be ultimately good for the plant breeders to develop varieties that withstand during drought, drought stress mm -hmm. and giving a higher symbiotic nitrogen fixation and higher yield so I think this research will be really helpful in plant breeders in the future. And on the other hand, as I mentioned, in uh, the, there will be a, the, the pop world population is uh, accelerating nowadays. And so especially for countries like, uh, de for developing countries, this will be a cheap protein source. And even in, in terms of Canada, the vegan population is rising at an alarming rate, especially in Vancouver and Toronto, so that this will be a good protein source for them. And, and also this is actually this, uh, in terms of Canada, it is the seventh, uh, it, it is, it, it's on the seventh rank of producing soybean. So this will have a good economical impact for Canada as well. So I think it has lots of benefits. And I should mention that Soybean is the world's number one legume crop. That's why I choose it for my research even. So this, has, I think my research will have a global impact with this climate change in the future. Thank you. Wonderful. All our questions done from our judges? Perfect, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much again for all those answers. We do have a few questions from our audience that I would love to run by you. Uh, so you did touch on your irrigation machine, uh, but there's definitely interest from our audience members there. And would you be able to tell us a little bit about the software running the machine? Yes, uh, the software I have used here is basically Arduino, and I have used a Putty software, which is its, its name as Putty. We, I have used that Putty software to access a remote computer. And other than that, basically, I have coded this with using Arduino software using C language. Awesome, very cool. And can you please tell us, or can you please explain why you didn't inoculate the seeds? Yes, that's a pretty good question. Uh, I didn't inoculate seeds at the first, and I inoculated seeds after the establishment of the plant because uh, I have already I have removed two plants, leaving one plant per pot after like one week. And the other uh, reason is, according to the literature, like uh, better nodulation can be observed inoculating after the plant establishment. And also, but in field trials, it will be a kind of problem because indigenous rhizobium will be grow if it grows in a field trials. But here we have maintained a controlled environment. And on, uh, another aspect is according to the rhizobia host specificity, correct? Uh, nodulation, nodulation takes place when a correct rhizobia meets the correct host plant. For instance, uh, because rhizobia japonicum uh, works only if it meets the host soybean plants and or else like rhizobium leguminosarum uh, is for the fowl bean. And above all, I had some controls and they didn't show any nodules. They didn't show any nodules as well. Those are the reasons that I didn't inoculate the seeds. Wonderful, thank you. And I believe you touched on this briefly, but could you explain a little further why you selected the soybean over, there, over other legumes? 
Yes, actually, first we decided to explore this concept with the population. We already have the genotypic data. And the soybean is the world's number one uh, legume crop. So our research actually can have a very global impact. And also due to the climate change, uh, we will have like a longer crop duration and there will be more opportunities uh, for the future, for the, so for the growers to grow soybean in a province like Alberta. And in the future, we will investigate the same concept in other legumes such as fava bean. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so those are our audience questions. Um, everyone's saying thank you for answering in the chat. Uh, no, thanks, Ashley, and you're welcome. No problem. Um, if we don't have any more questions going up, I will just quickly turn it back to our judges for some closing remarks, if they have anything they'd like to say. Um, Clarice, do you want to start? Yeah, so um, thank you so much, Lil Roos. The Rukshi for your presentation. I also want to thank all our audience that's participating and join us in this um, event. I feel like um, so we had three amazing presentation for the climate change global warming um, section. Um, all of them have, you know, a bit different sort of like approach or different themes in terms of global warming and what topics they are in, but all were able to present like how it can impact on a global scale like the research project and that excites me and i feel like after this i gained more understanding of the different disciplines that um, contributes or like that can help with our fight against climate change um so yeah so thank you so much for this opportunity to join this um, amazing event and yeah i wish bill ruski luck for next um next week i think it's the awarding ceremony and yeah again thank you so much for being here well, celia um my internet connection is quite unstable mm -hmm. we can hear you if you'd like um oh my i'm my internet connection is quite unstable, so I think I'm going to uh, turn off my video. Can you mm -hmm. hear me? Okay. Yeah, well. Perfect. Just wanted to thank you, Dolorochi. A very complex uh, project, really thorough, and I'm in awe of the fact that you kept alive all these thousand plants mm -hmm. and have such a consistent way of measuring the progress and uh, such a conclusive set of evidence pieces to to demonstrate your hypothesis. And I'm looking forward to learning more about these results and to the next projects that I'm sure you you lead in the future. All the success. Wonderful. Yeah, I would like to give our thanks again to our judges for taking the time to be here today and on the other days. And of course, to you, Dil Rakshi, this is a, a yeah. wonderful presentation. Um, I feel like I learned so much and it was really fascinating to hear about the work that you're doing. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, and one word, Ashley, and I would like to thank both the judges, Dr. Karis Kenta and Judge Cecilia for all your valuable comments and questions raised. That really helps for me to develop my research further. And thank you very much, Ashley and Dr. Noin and the Squiz team for providing us this kind of a platform to uh, exhibit our research. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen quickly and I'll give you a few closing remarks and then we can head out uh, into our days, I guess. <laughs> Let's see if I can just get this presenting. Perfect. Um, oops. Okay, well, you can all see that. Uh, yeah, so this was our final presentation. It feels it's, we've been doing this since June, so it's really exciting to reach the end and end of such a highlight and such a wonderful presentation. If you would like to see any previous presentations, you'll be able to find those on the Squist YouTube channel. So Noreen will have that uploaded shortly and you'll be able to watch your own um, or watch the other ones. And they will always be on there as a resource if you need to share any information about what you've been doing here in the science symposium. I would also like to say we do have our mega finale event coming up on September 22nd. 
Uh, we will be announcing our winners and a whole bunch of other exciting things. So please mark your calendars. We will be following up with everyone to let you know about more details about this event and what can be expected in the next couple of days. And with that, maybe Noeen, I will pass it over to you just for a second to see if you have any closing remarks you'd like to share. Uh... I, but I can say, I mean, yeah, I'm so, so happy, so excited. It was just an idea in the beginning for all these undergrads and grad students that I wanted to do something. Squiz provided me that platform and I came with it. And uh, it was very challenging in the beginning because uh, nobody knows me in Canada, right? And <laughs> not many people know even about Squiz. So, so it was... Uh, uh, it was really very challenging to reach to every student in every province and in every institute and university. I just didn't want to hear in future that, okay, some student is telling me, oh, I missed this opportunity because I could not hear about it. I wanted to make it sure that every student would know and they could submit their application. It's a good chance for them and I'm so happy when I saw all these presentations starting from the beginning. They are so good quality, such a high quality that I was just thinking sometimes that my own PhD thesis is not that level. You know, when I did my PhD, it, it, seriously, it was so good. The work that these grads, undergrad students are doing, it has such a good impact on society. And uh, I'm really happy and very amazed. And we have wonderful sponsors who sponsored this event. And yeah, I am overall very happy. <laughs> That's all I can say. And thanks to Dilrakshi. Thanks to all our students who submitted applications, who showed their faith and trust in us, and who came forward and made it successful. This event was mean for all students, for all of you. And you made it successful, and that's uh, I think that's that's what means for me basically. And thank you, and thanks for all audience who came today, and thanks Ashley. She is my partner in crime in this symposium. She is the co-chair, and it's uh, all the effort is mainly with Ashley and me. Basically, we two are behind this symposium thing. So thanks, audience. Thanks for coming, for joining us, and thanks for making it such a successful event. And we are really happy and grateful to all of you. And over to you, Ashley. Thanks. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you for those kind words, Noeen. And that that is it from me. Um, I'm happy to let everyone um, continue on with their days. I'm see it's an hour later for you in Alberta, so maybe you want to grab a snack or something, Dilrashi. But again, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation. We all really enjoyed it. And we'll see you at the mega finale event next sure. week. Sure. Thanks, Ashley. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.